Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that are sitting in the back row or you are new coming in and you enjoy what you're hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button, making sure your ring notifications are set to all. That way it reminds you of every time I upload a video, and it also helps me in the channel. I've got good, good news. <laughs> the man that I call the godfather to Back to Ashes, Inner Scarce Sleep, will be reading two stories within this video. If you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right after the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Can someone please let me know their thoughts on this? So, I'm a 31-year-old female, and I have been living at the same apartment complex for nearly four years. There was a guy who was about 45 or so who lives on the same floor as me and has for about the past year or so. He is so awful. I usually don't notice or recognize a lot of people who live there, but I quickly noticed something about this guy because of how rude he was. Whenever we would happen to go downstairs in the elevator together in the morning before work, he would just mean mug me. And then we would walk out of the glass doors into the parking lot. I would be walking behind him, and he'd let the doors close on me and not hold them open. One day, about six months ago, my fiancé and I walked up behind him, waiting for the elevator. And when he saw us, he was standing in front of us and just shook his head, almost in disgust. Keep in mind, my fiancé, nor I, have ever had a conversation with this man. Then, this is where things get strange. About six months ago, I decided to hold the elevator doors open for him. When I saw him coming down the hall, he told me thank you. And when we got downstairs, for the first time ever, he held the door open for me. The next time, my then fiancé, who is now my husband, saw him in the parking lot. Whenever he saw my now husband with me, he mouthed, fucking bitch, to himself as he passed us. But to make things worse, whenever I see him alone in the parking lot, he smiles and smirks at me and smiles as he walked past me, almost like two people who have history together or like we know each other personally. It's so freaking weird. But about a month ago, when he saw my husband and I together, once again, in the mailroom, he covered his mouth with his mail. Can someone please explain to me what the hell they think is going on with this dude? I took a lot of psychology classes in college, and I can't even explain this behavior. I'm getting strange serial killer vibes, to be honest. But, like I said... We have literally never had a conversation with him. My husband and I are both very friendly people, and I feel like we give off those vibes. So, yeah, that's strange. Today, I was on my way home. I was about one mile out from my apartment cruising with my windows down, smoking a cigarette listening to some Kendrick Lamar. I noticed to my right that a white car had sped up to be next to me, but I didn't think too much of it. As I approached where I would usually turn left into my complex, I decided based on their behavior, this wasn't the best idea. At this point, I still had not looked at the driver or looked over to acknowledge them. I continued past my usual turn and got to the next light, where again they pulled up next to me. I heard a girl's voice, 
so I assumed it was some girls just talking amongst themselves trying to keep up with me. After the light turned green, I started speeding up to a max of around 80 or 85 miles per hour down a residential road with only their car and my own on it. The car was neck to neck with me the entire time, not trying to race, not trying to overtake me or anything, completely matching my speed. I think, okay, this is fun, because, I mean, going fast with a stranger is a cool experience sometimes. But once again, I became wary when we approached the next light, and I decide to turn left to basically circle back to my house, thinking they had their fun, and I had obliged long enough. She had been next to me or following me for at least 10 miles at this point. They immediately switched two lanes over to get behind me. I turn left and speed up once again, and they once again match my exact speed. I still have not looked at the driver at this point. I want to get into the furthest left lane to be able to turn down the street towards my house, but she was directly next to me so I couldn't get over. We approach the light and it's a red. I slow to a stop and still don't look over. Pulling a drag of my cigarette and looking for a song to pick, I suddenly hear a girl's voice ask, where did you get your glasses? It is at this moment I decide to look over and see a single driver, a girl. The first thing I notice about her is her wide-eyed stare. If you have ever seen a psychotic break in a person or drug-induced psychosis in a person, you would know what I'm talking about. I went to college for psychology, so that plays a little bit into my decision-making in this as well. I also noticed that her back windows were completely tinted. It was a pretty nice car, so that means she has access to money. And after I made those assessments, I responded over there at Vista Vision or whatever it was. And she replies, oh, and is still staring at me. She then asks, are you from here? And I say, no, well, I've been here for a while, but I'm from Alaska. The next question she asked is really what put me into suspicious and alert mode. Oh, so you have a lot of friends. Actually, she made it as more of a statement, not a question, while still wide-eyed. At this point, I am sort of like, all right. But then she asks, so what do you like to do for fun? And I reply, uh, well, I mean, go to concerts. But this question weirded me out too, because it's like, it's been a pandemic. What I do for fun now isn't the same. And then she goes, oh, okay. And just stares at me. Then I wait for her to continue or something. And then I decide to ask, how about you? And she replies, oh, uh, I don't really do anything really. I've never been to a concert. And I reply, oh, I see. At this point, the light finally turns green and I think that's the end of it. Suddenly I hear, you're really sexy. Now here's the thing, I am not one to take compliments well, so I awkwardly reply, well, thank you. And then she asks, do you want to exchange numbers? While we are driving and she is matching my speed still, I hesitate for a moment, but for the sake of the experience and a story, I say sure. She says, okay and I pull forward and she pulls behind me. I drive for about two miles before reaching the point basically where she had started following me in the first place. I pull into another little neighborhood that has an office and parking area in the front. I purposely park in a spot so she can pull up next to me and tell me her number on my left side. She then pulls into a spot basically two spots away to the right of me. Weird, I thought to myself. At this time, it's around 5.50 or 6 p.m., and it's pretty dark outside. I roll down my passenger side window, and she rolls down her window and is staring at me and goes, what? And I say, I didn't say anything. I then ask, so do you want my number or do you want to give me yours? She stares at me, thinking. She says, you just take my number. I pull out my phone, and I look at her and say, okay, go ahead. She stares at me. She says one second and reaches around for a maximum of four seconds before she sticks her hand out the window with a piece of paper. Come here, she says with the first smile she's had the whole time. Why? What's up? I ask. Come here, she says still smiling, waving the paper. At this moment, I notice one hand is out the window waving the paper while the other appears to be reaching into the door compartment below the window. 
Looking at her, I say, I don't know, can I trust you? I mean, I don't see why not. She says with this look of total fake shock that I would say that. I don't know. I don't know you at all. Now this might sound like I'm overthinking things, but based on her facial reactions, or lack thereof, I didn't feel like she was hurt that I was weirded out. And that's weird. At this moment, I say, I'm sorry, I just watch way too many YouTube videos. Because it's true, for the past five months, I've been obsessed with interrogation videos and other criminal investigations. And she then says, okay, just give me your number. I then say, okay, are you ready? She stares at me, yeah. I then start listing off my number. She stares at me. After I finish, she stares at me. Then I say, oh, and my name is... She repeats, yes. She then waves the paper again. You don't want it? No, just text me and I'll have your number, I reply. She stares at me. Okay. I then say have a good night and I go to leave. She starts her car and backs it up and basically pulls up behind me, stopping for no reason. I notice she's looking my direction as I peek at my driver's side rearview mirror. I then start to reverse so she knows that I'm not staying around. She pulls out of the way. I head home. Park. Make sure nobody followed me. Head up to my home. I don't know who or what was behind those tinted windows. And I don't know why she wanted me to come over there to get her number in 2020. Sketch. I don't know why she made the statement about me having a lot of friends. I mean, I can speculate. But either way, I think if I had made the wrong decision tonight, I could have ended up dead or somewhere I didn't want to be. This is going to be a long camping story told by someone who doesn't speak English as a native, so please be understanding and even, you know, just ignore the mess ups. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such, so yeah. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and were against the idea. I had to lie to them that we would stay in a hotel near Cozia National Park so they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did. So, uh, okay, long story short, we had to travel to Bucharest to this park, which is around 200 kilometers in two hours by train. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train except the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. This is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited thinking that we would have that whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it is a very rare thing to happen. And of course, after 10 to 20 minutes, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful, beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those that don't like people. Not this dog, no. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed, as if he were a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by it, so obviously, I started asking the man about his dog, which it would be a long and awkward trip to have in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog, except the commands he would give to his dog, no other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a very weird name to give a dog because for this particular example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate it to the Romanian and name the dog that. But I remember to each their own. I asked him, why such a scary name? And he bluntly replied, this dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and is good at. 
Now, I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have similar personalities to his owner. And most of the times, I would judge people with dogs on how the animal reacts to the world and to his owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not have a good vibe in return. I brushed everything over thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt in the woods. I don't know. Then I started thinking which woods are legal to hunt in our country. While I was thinking of that, the guy, out of nowhere, asked us if we were traveling to the Kozia National Park. That was surprisingly accurate considering that the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and way longer before we even met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing because in my country, people who happen to go into the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination or be honest. I took the honesty route and am judging myself for that. Never be too honest with strangers or honest at all after you read this story. We confirmed that we were going to that place, asked what else there is to see around since he started talking about the area and, well... Considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals we encounter. Told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we need to climb. Advised us to visit the Lotrishore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and to try out the local restaurant. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if his experience was a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud clink noise. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just a stuffed dog. Anyway... We are reaching our destination, say our goodbyes, and the man waves at us, and we faced against him to go on about our way. I turned right back around because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was, and the man and his dog were no longer there. Not just that, but also his baggage was gone as well. That creeped me out a bit, but mm, who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We start walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilograms each, and reach a tunnel, digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels, which, if traveled down at night, would make your hair stand up straight. Luckily for me, we traveled down daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We would just see the end, but by the time we got to the middle of it, we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stop. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh, no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog. I go right towards the sound, and in the middle of the road, I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on its butt, crying so hard and laying on the cement, looking pretty hurt, as if a car maybe hit him. I freeze and thought to myself that our trip is over. I must save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointing ears up gets up and, like a doofus, starts running desperately towards us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Yes, someone threw her in the river to kill her. All wet, cold, and hungry, of course, we were going to take her too. 
So, here we are. 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with map, trying to find a spot to camp for the night. We passed by the monastery, the man in the train station mentioned, but because we had puppies, eh, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priests wouldn't allow us. So we just walked around the property, through the gardens, until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts to the ground and cry. Such drama. We walk and we walk and we walk until we decide to stop because it was getting late and I was getting really hungry. We found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage in the middle of the wood. We call it Troyinitsa. It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house. It was basically a roof and four small walls and an opening, not the door. You could go in, like hide from the rain. There was an icon inside and a Bible with pages ripped out. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible, was really annoyed to see that people would write down their name in it, like couples do on a damn tree. But on one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably someone who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, make a fire, unpack, make food, and eat. We feed the puppies, which now are cuddled up in our tent, and finally, darkness starts to rise all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off, it felt like all of the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. So it's maybe 12 a.m. We are in the tent, cuddling to keep warm. The puppies were awake and started crying. I get up and unzip the tent to put them out to pee. They do, and I get them back in. They cry some more, and the smallest one starts shivering. At this point, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. Sound it like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? He says, up to this day, that he cannot explain what the hell he saw. He says it was a slithery figure with feet that made a snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature runs back into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's 3 a.m. this time when we wake up the puppies being fussy again. The fire's nearly dead and we clearly have no idea to put up a sustaining fire, we think to ourselves. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness, and I swear to God, I hear whispers coming from between the bushes. I look up at the sky, consider it 3 a.m., and hear birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert in birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these sure weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated. I look at the fire and follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. 
This was very out of the ordinary for me because it created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going up into the woods, creating a track for me, probably, to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burns out. None of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At that point, I began to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds being agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us had eyes on them. Like, the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing, you know, paranormal related, since someone explained that these type of trees have a branch that is ripped from the root, and that's the shape that is left after. But there was so many, like a hundred eyes, all looking at the exact spot we decided to camp. Having only that religious, tiny landmark to mentally protect us. And as I inspect my surroundings, I hear another movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground and don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent over silhouette comes out of it and half inside the bush and half outside. He stares at us. I call my boyfriend, and we're both standing there like, what the fuck is that? Is it a bear cub? No, is it a wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the same way like a dog does after a bath, and I hear a distinguished click like a dog collar. At this time, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares the creature back into the woods, through the bush from which it initially came out of, then calms down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again during that night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep. The puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open just a little bit, just enough to have my eye peek through it, right at the early mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep at that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts my dreams. From that exact bush, we see a human head popping out and looking forward at our tent. Notice that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from inside the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg. Bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted by both the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. by our fire, basically extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This all happening at two to three meters away from our tent. I look at the man with horror because I recognize them. And now the clink I heard earlier from that animal is explained. It is the same man from the train with his dog too. I don't know if he is following us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to you know, stalk us. But this guy was there since 12 a.m. at least because our fire would be dead every two to three hours and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we intentionally explained as animals crossing the land. 
After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit, until only his head would be out, with a disfigured looking mouth like a moaning ghost. You try going back to sleep after that. That's what I thought. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, light ourselves some torches, and stayed near the camp fire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit, I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that distant bush. I did not need my answers, actually. Any explanations. I just wanted daylight to get the fuck out of there. And we did. We packed our stuff and we got the hell out of Dodge. We planned a four-day camping trip. And this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that guy followed us or it was just a coincidence... It was enough to ruin it all. As a conclusion to my story and any advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination of strangers. You don't know where their minds take them and what they could end up doing to you. Always stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movement, changes of temperature, and so on. Always protect yourself. I'm a South American woman, but have been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21 to the small mountain town of Silverthorn. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA, work and travel during summer break in the South. Up to that point, I had never seen snow in my life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco not too far from the hostel I was living in. The hostel itself had its own creepy stories, but I won't talk about them in details at the moment. That'll be for later, perhaps. So far, I didn't know exactly what kind of job I would be doing in the hotel. All I knew is that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date and time to talk to the owner, a Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-40s back then. So I show up, introduce myself with the basic English that I had at the time and tell him that I'm excited to start working there. He gives me a weird long stare, almost as if he was analyzing me. He was a tall man with very pronounced eyebrows, so that kind of creeped me out for a second. He then showed me to the restaurant and said I would be working there as a hostess, besides delivering room service orders. I really didn't think my English was that good to be in close contact with the public back then. I thought I'd be working back of the house or housekeeping, but he insisted. For those who are familiar with the area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Vail, so it's needless to say they get very, very busy there during the ski season, and I was dealing with customers from all over the world. That's when I also started helping out as a server during breakfast and of course would get lots of orders wrong by my lack of English, which made the owner very mad. I remember one time that my coworker and friend was taking a bit longer to wipe down one of the tables when he had guests waiting to be seated. So he grabbed the towel from her hand, yelled at both of us to get out of his and stop being so useless, and then proceeded to throw the towel at her face. Let me just make a small note here to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, with fantastic English and living in the country for years, but he would always try and find ways to show us how slow, dumb, or inferior we were compared to him, an American citizen. Then at night, 
after the place had slowed down, he would then act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, make forward comments about my appearance and even caress. Yeah, you read that correctly, my legs. I was starting to feel uncomfortable around him and would always try to not be in the same room as he was. During work hours, I would be forced on customers or talking to my coworkers and I would never make eye contact with him if he was present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was a big incident in the hostel I lived at. I was out that night with a few co-workers, but learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high on who knows which drug and started chasing down one of my friends, also from South America, inside the hostel while pointing a gun at him, yelling racial slurs and making death threats. He got arrested, but it was easy to say that most of the students living there no longer felt safe. While telling about this incident to my coworkers one day, the big boss overheard the conversation and immediately came to check on me and make sure that I was okay. I thought he was being nice, and I thanked him for checking. He said that I should not be staying at the hostel anymore given the circumstances, and invited me to stay in one of the hotel rooms free of charge for the next two weeks while I looked for a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact that the hotel would be completely booked often since it was the peak of ski season. I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was so overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five other girls in the hostel and for getting some extra sleep before working my next breakfast shift, since I was now literally living at work. That was until one night later that week, where I felt extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day and delivering orders to several rooms. I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep. I was off the next day. I think it was around two in the morning when I woke up completely groggy and noticed that my door room was open. I could see the light in the hallway. Then I noticed the silhouette of a tall person standing inside my room and watching me sleep. I couldn't see a face, but could definitely tell that it was a man. As I realized what was going on, I hear a metal clanking noise, as if he was getting ready to take his belt off. What the heck? I yelled. That person quickly got out of my bedroom. The next day, I asked management and my co-workers, and they said that there was definitely someone in my room the night before. They said I was probably dreaming or someone from housekeeping must have gotten into the wrong room. Wrong room? At two in the morning? Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence at all after that. To my relief, of course. Nothing else happened. I moved on, got a new job, a new apartment to live in, etc., about a year after my little incident, while checking the local Summit Daily News, who do I see on the front page? Him. The owner. He had been arrested the night before after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and letting himself into their rooms once they had crashed for the night. They woke up, and there he was, standing in the room, staring at them, while getting ready to make his next move. They screamed bloody murder and called the police immediately. Was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure that it was, but kind of relieved that I didn't get to find that out. What creeps me out the most about this situation is that what about those nights that I completely crashed after one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance. And oh man, it really did it for me. I'm from the sea level and not a big drinker, but a few times I woke up with zero memories from the night before. So the unsettling question is, was that the first time that someone got in my room? And how many more guests at this hotel had this happen to them without them even realizing it?
This happened about three years ago, but I still think about it from time to time, and it still creeps me out. I was 21 at the time, and had just moved into a new apartment on the first floor of a building. It was late one night, and my roommate was out with somebody. They knocked on the door. This was not uncommon, as we were in college, and my roommate has friends that would come by to hang out at all hours of the day. I just figured it was one of his friends, so I get up and check the peephole. Staring right back at me through the peephole is an eyeball pressed against it. Again, this is also something that one of our friends might do just to be funny. I chuckled and opened the door, surprised to see a guy in his mid-twenties that I did not recognize. He was strange, to say the least. He was very hyper and immediately launched into a door-to-door -door salesman type pitch. I can't remember exactly what he was even trying to sell, but it was something about the local university or some something like that, which I also attended at the time. Cool, okay? The whole time he was talking, he kept looking past me into the apartment. He was fidgeting and even standing on his tiptoes to see inside. Still, I just thought the guy was weird and nervous and might not have been all there, if you know what I mean. I politely declined to buy anything from him, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I finally had to be pretty stern in place that I was not interested he finally accepted defeat, and as I was closing the door, he put his hand out and stopped the door from closing before I can be like, what the fuck, dude? He smiles at me and says, I like Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 too. Now me and my roommate had been staying up late into the night playing Mario Kart 64 in my bedroom for the past several days before that but there was nothing that he could see from the apartment entrance that had anything to do with Mario Kart. I was taken aback and trying to add things up in my head and confusingly ask, how do you know I play Mario Kart? Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I just thought that anyone with a couch like that would be into Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64. Uh, it's like a... It's like a retro game, and that's a retro couch. What in the ever-living fuck? <laughs> what the hell is that? What the hell kind of explanation is that? <laughs> then he was like, uh, okay, bye, and literally scurried away. I shut the door and locked it. I start trying to put the pieces together on how he could have known that because obviously it wasn't because of my grandma's old couch. Remember, it's a first floor apartment that backed up to the woods. My roommate got home and shortly after that and I immediately asked him about the encounter. He was freaked on it too and so we start investigating. At first, it seemed as if there was no way to even see inside my bedroom. My blinds were always down. We went outside and tested it and found that the only way to see inside would have been if you had your face right up against the window. And even then, you kind of had to crouch and close one eye just to get a glimpse of anything inside. A couple more creepy details. My window was over a balcony, and the Nintendo 64 console itself was stored inside of the TV stand and was not visible. You'd only be able to see it while we were actively playing, which we never did until we were a little too stoned and it was like 2 in the morning. So basically, this fucking creep has been jumping the railing of our balcony, pressing his face against the window and watching us play Mario Kart in the middle of the night. I never saw the man again, but needless to say, I was pretty paranoid for a while, especially after that. 
I constantly checked my windows and wake up in the middle of the night paranoid that he was standing just a couple feet away watching me sleep. Just a very unsettling encounter. I'm glad that nothing more came of it and that I never saw him again. But I have always wondered what his motives were. Alrighty, dear listeners, this one is being cut short tonight, but I promise I'll make it up to you. This also brings an end to true creepy encounters. I would like to take a moment and thank all the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dola Khaleesi, Eda Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Plays, Patty's Knees, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. If it weren't for you, there would be no me or this channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed the selection. Until next time, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.